now welcome you to our study. It's always a delight to see you and to be with you and to have fellowship with you. We want to learn the deeper things of God. I can assure you that <clears throat> as far as my, I can tell in traveling throughout the world, there's a greater thirst for knowledge today than there has ever been in the history of the world. There are more people seeking learning today. And what a beautiful concept to bring it right into your home through Christian television. So we're delighted to see you. May God bless you. In this special series of studies, what was God doing when non-Christian religions were born? Was God just sitting by doing nothing? Did he have no witness in the earth? Or do these religions antedate God, you know, and antedate uh, the, the religion that we know is the true religion of there is a God in heaven and a living God. In these special studies, I wish to teach from my dispensational chart that I have right here with me, and uh, also from a large world globe that I have also right here with me, uh, showing you where the great religions were born and, and how they came to be. Uh, Judaism and Christianity was born in this area. Mohammedism was born in this area. Two great religions were born in, in this area here, the Buddhist religion and also the Hindu religion. The Confucian religion and the Tao religion were born in China, and then the Shinto religion born in Japan. And so from the, from the coast of, uh, of Japan over here on the Pacific Ocean, right straight across the, the total belt of Asia, running almost like a chain, uh, we have the birth of the great religions of the world. And... Uh, we would not be interested in this except for one fact. The Bible teaches us that if you do not know God, the true and the living God, and that if you do not know Jesus, then there can be no heaven for you. And the Lord brought this very clear to me in Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 18. And at the moment, I didn't know it was in the Bible. God told me to read Ezekiel 3, 18. He says, when, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speak it to him to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. That same man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. God said, you have a responsibility to the ungodly throughout the world. Ooh. I said, Lord, you ought to tell everybody that. He says, I have. It's in my word. You better read it. And every believer, every Christian has an obligation to the non-Christian to love, to help, to teach, to guide. And God is expecting it. We could bring the whole world to Christ and to truth and to knowledge if each one of us were just to win a few souls a day to the Lord Jesus Christ. You wouldn't need any vast campaigns. You just need each one of us doing our share and our part. I hope you will feel your responsibility to this and do it. The Lord Jesus said in, in John 8 and 32, you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free. In verse 36, the Lord Jesus said, If the Son make you free, you shall be free indeed. And the Word of God tells us in Acts 10 and 35, In every nation, every nation, he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted of God. I want us to go during this special program to the ancient land of Egypt. Uh, let us just have a look at that ancient land for a moment here. There are many, many uh, books. Here's one that I hold in my hand here. It's called Eternal Egypt and a history of the great civilization that ruled the Mediterranean world for centuries. Isn't that amazing? And, uh, and we'd like to take you into that land. It has many pictures and most of it is in relation uh, to their gods and their goddesses that, that dominated uh, their civilization for such a long time. So let us I look at it together, and I think you will enjoy it. Uh, Egypt, uh, beginning in the very first book of the Bible, uh, has a divine relationship uh, with, uh, with God's people and with God, and, and they still have one today. It, it hasn't changed. Uh, Egypt uh, runs along the north coast of Africa here and uh, is a, a very, a very important land. It's called the United Arab Republic on this, uh, on this uh, globe here. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, the Red Sea uh, and the Suez Canal coming through here. And they're adjacent, of course, to Israel, very, very close together. And that is uh, the modern land and the very ancient land that we call Egypt. Uh, 
I'd like to take you to our, our big uh, uh, divine dispensation uh, chart that we have here with us today. And on this chart, we can teach you the truths that God wants you to know. In eternity, God was there. He is all in all. As we have written on the bottom of the map, God is all in all. And up at the top, he is the Alpha. And at the end of the chart, he is the Omega. Uh, he created the world. He, he made the dispensation of innocence here. And Adam and Eve lived in that innocence. He then went to conscience. And, and there, uh, in that dispensation for about 1,500 years or more, up until the time of the flood, uh, we, we had the dispensation of conscience. And uh, between the two of them, you have about uh, 2,000 years. We moved out of that into the human government area, and uh, there was only less than 500 years until we come to the Tower of Babel and to the dispersion of the peoples on the face of the earth, and also then the dividing of the continents that kept men from one another in order that God might bring a Messiah. The reason you have over 2,000 over 2,000 languages on the face of the earth today is that God was segregating human beings in order to bring a Messiah. Then we come to promise. And, and this dispensation, God was making promises and commitments uh, to mankind. And it's during this time when God talked to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and so forth that some of the pagan religions were born. And of course, when they got to Egypt, they already found that uh, Egypt here uh, had, been, had been in a state of, of accepting uh, uh, these religions that had no relationship with truth nor with God. And uh, some of their religions had to do with the, uh, uh, with the plagues that came because the frog was something they worshipped, the lice was something they worshipped, the flies was something that they, that they, that they, that they worshipped. And, and so uh, these plagues that came upon them had a right strong relationship with their gods. It was putting down their gods. Uh, you know, and when the plagues would come, then that god wasn't able to help at that time. Uh, beginning at the end of the time the children of Israel were in Egypt, we have the law. And in this period of time is actually when the great religions were born. When God said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, then in areas of the world, Hinduism began to be born, uh, Buddhism uh, began to be born at a time when God had said, Thou shalt not have before me any images of anything, of any likeness, of anything in heaven above, earth beneath, or the waters under the earth. And these people originally, these people originally, they knew this. They, they, their little children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren may not have known it, but originally the people knew of the living God because it goes right back. There are no groups of people on the face of the earth that came from anybody but Adam and then Noah. And so they all came in the embodiment of truth. Some continued to serve God. Some did not continue to serve God. And that's what makes the differences on the face of this earth. Now, the ancient religions of, of Egypt are different from their modern religion. There might be uh, there might be some mixing back and forth, but it's down very deep inside of the people in the form of, of superstitions and, and, and old traditions and things like this because uh, they do not follow the, the same animistic religions that they followed uh, so, so long ago. Now, the cross stands in the center of the great chart, of course. The Lord Jesus Christ came. Uh, he brought salvation to the world, and, and, uh, and then there began the dispensation of grace. The only great world religion after Christianity is Mohammedism. It came about 700 years plus after the Lord Jesus Christ came to save the world. And the church was in a decadent uh, situation or it never would have been. It never, it never would have had a chance if the church had not been in a decadent condition. If it had been vital, if it had been what God wanted it to be, it could not have been. And uh, the only great religions that we're going to see arise now uh, will, be, will be nationalism. And it will be something toward communism. We will talk about that in one of these. And also, we will revert uh, to, to demon powers. Spiritism will become very strong. Demon worship will be very strong. And this will be centered in the Antichrist. And all these things are to take place. This is called the Great, the great Tribulation. And this Great Tribulation here uh, has to do when, when God uh, judges man because of all of his sins. And at the end of this 6,000-year uh, period, and the end of this great tribulation period, we will enter into a new world called the Millennium Kingdom. The Lord Jesus Christ will reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords at that time. And we will reign with him forever and ever and be with him. And what a great day and what a great moment it will be. Now I'd like to take you uh, to the land of Egypt and uh, let us look together in especially into the, into the ancient part of Egypt. In Exodus, 
uh, chapter 5 and verse 2, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Now, these are very, very strong statements for him to make. Uh, number one, this in a period of time uh, when Moses was in that land to let the people of Israel go. 400 years before that, uh, Joseph was the prime minister in Egypt and the, and the Pharaoh of that time let everybody know that uh, through revelation, uh, uh, Joseph was able to save their country and that the spirit of the gods was in Joseph. And, and Joseph made a very clear definition. He said, now Pharaoh, I cannot tell you about your dream. Uh, your soothsayers, your magicians, and your witchcraft has all failed you. I cannot tell you as a person, but my God that I serve can tell you. That was the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, the true and the living God that goes back from there uh, straight to Noah, and from Noah unto Adam, uh, the true and the living God. But this Pharaoh, only 400 years removed, says, now listen. He says, I don't know Jehovah. I don't know Jehovah. I don't know that God. He did know some gods, and I'm going to tell you about the gods he knew. That's, that's going to be our subject, uh, the gods that he did know. But he, he says I, I, that I should obey his voice, because Moses said, this is the voice of the Lord. And he says, I don't know the, the, the Jehovah you're talking about, and I will not let Israel go. And so not knowing God, he fought against God, and he died because of his transgressions against God. Now, Egypt, as all of us know, is one of the great historical nations of all the earth, one of the great empires of all the earth. Before Babylon was a mighty empire, Egypt was a great empire and made, uh, made oftentimes Canaan land, or the holy land that we know today, a subject under herself through her marching armies that could go right up the coast and they could go right into the Holy Land uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a land. They had a, a land highway, the King's Highway, that went right straight up there. And so they had a, and it was a world highway, really. You could go from there to China. <laughs> uh, just go right up and go across to Syria and, and across to Babylon. And the way you could go to India and so forth, over land. And so Egypt uh, was one of the great nations of history. Egypt was a land uh, that God became involved in. It's very interesting uh, to us as I'm going to show you here that God became very much involved in, in Egypt. Now, it is believed by many Bible scholars that God is still very much involved in Egypt. Now, you see Abraham, that God chose to save the world. In, in, in Genesis chapter 12, God said of Abraham, says, through you and your seed, I will bless the entire world. And, and it was so it was a, a fact that God stated that the seed of Abraham would bless the world. Now, he had two seeds. He had the promised seed, uh, which, be, which became the Jewish people and, and, uh, through Isaac. But he also had the Arab seed through Ishmael. And, and, the, and the girl that gave birth to Ishmael was an Egyptian. And Ishmael married an Egyptian. So in two generations, in two generations, we had more Egyptian blood than we had Israeli blood in, 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 the, in what you would call the, the uh, Ishmaelite peoples. And then they bent more and more toward Egypt. And so Egypt had a very dominant part in the, in the blood, in the bloodstream of Abraham. This makes them uh, very important and shows you that God was involved with them. Uh, today, Egypt is, is not an animistic nation uh, or, or a Buddhist nation, but they, they uh, mostly uh, belong to the Muslim or the Mohammedan uh, religion. And this uh, is a very dominant religion in Egypt and, and a very strong religion. In Moses' day, uh, Egypt was different. Uh, they were animist and they, they had all the magicians which served uh, under the king and, and directed the king and, and, uh, and told him what to do and when to do it. In Exodus chapter 7 and verse 11, it says, And then Pharaoh called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now, the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner uh, with their enchantments. And so they were people that dealt in, in sorcery, in enchantments, and in the, and these wise men. And these, these wise men, of course, uh, were nothing but pronosticators of the future and, and were men that, uh, that, that actually just worshiped the devil. That's all that they worshiped. So in that day, uh, the, the house of Pharaoh and of Egypt was all bound up in this business of animism. 
and of worshiping objects and all kinds of things, and also of making statues. And uh, they dealt with the unknown and they dealt with the supernatural, but they did it through demon power. And, and they were not just educated men. They, these were men that were dealing in, in, the, in the spiritual and in the supernatural. Egypt had its sorcerers, and, and these men sought neither, neither God nor true information to give out. They sought for knowledge beyond their human mind, what we call ESP today, and they opened themselves up to this. And any time that you do, uh, the devil uh, will, will, uh, will, will possess you. In looking into the, uh, in the early Egyptian history, the sun god Ra was maybe one of their chief gods that they prayed to. They prayed to the sun early every morning as it would arise. Uh, Egypt has a a beautiful climate, really, and the sun rises almost every morning. I guess it does rise every morning. Very seldom do they have uh, overcast skies or rain or something that stops it from rising. And so they would worship the, the sun, and the sun was one of their very strong gods. And this god uh, had its habitation and lived in the sacred bull named Apis. And, and so the sun god, his spirit lived in the sacred bull. So now they had the heavens and the earth combined into gods. In, in that the sun god lived on the earth here in the sacred bull Apis. Now the great temple uh, for this sun god and this bull uh, god named Apis was in the place called Memphis. Uh, we, we go there every time we take a group to our people into Egypt. We always go and see this. Also, the Egyptians at that time had a goddess that had a, the head of a cat. It was a woman with a cat's head. And, and this this uh, uh, goddess was supposed to do all kinds of miracles and all kinds of remarkable things for people. Now, you can see that when you put a cat on, on the head of a human, uh, that only the devil, you know, would cause you to do it. God is a true God. He's a pure God. He's a good God. He made man in the image of God. And for one to get away off in left field, worship, worship in a cat head goddess, you can see that only the devil could do it. Uh, one of the things that they worship that's come to us many times, and I've gotten... I must have a double handful of these little things, is the beetle. And, and the, the beetle, they consider it as, a, as deity, and they worship the beetle, just a little crawling insect. And it's a remarkable thing to me that the devil could so debase the intelligence of people that had the power to build a pyramid that even baffles today the movement of the stone and, and, and it being built on the, on, the, on the circumference of the earth and built uh, in relation to the stars, to the North Star and so forth. The, the, the complicated geometry about the, the pyramids has baffled modern scientists. And it was built by those people. And at that time, uh, they, they were worshiping these creatures. And especially, uh, they worshiped the common cow. Uh, in, the book, in the book here uh, of Eternal Egypt, and other books that we have been studying in relation to this. And I have been to Egypt, of course, uh, many, many times uh, in my life. Uh, you can see uh, that one of their chief, one, one, one of their chief uh, items and articles and, and things that they worshipped over there uh, was uh, what we call the sacred cow. And uh, this is the kind of a creature uh, that it was that they, that they would be worshipping. Uh, and this is uh, from the textbook, of course, here uh, regarding that. Now, uh, it would be a debasing thing, as, as you would know and I would know, for a person to stoop down to worship a, 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 dumb, a dumb beast, and, and as, as a cow is. But that was part of the ancient Egypt, Egyptians' worship, and this is what the children of Israel came into. And that's the reason when they got in the wilderness, they made the, sacred, they made the golden calf. They were, they were bringing back the religions of, of the people of Egypt. And that's what I want you to know. You can bring pagan religion into this country and millions of people will accept it uh, because of a feeling they get along with it and that's the devil's power working with it. Now at this very moment, there, there, are, literally, there are literally hundreds of thousands of people that are bound up in spiritism and even Buddhism and many things because these religions are bound up in demon power and it attaches itself to people. And so the, the pharaohs, uh, were made priest kings before the people, so they were worshipped also. Then the sun god Ra was worshipped, and the, the air god Shu was worshipped, and the god Kumi, uh, which had a man's body and a ram's head, you see a lot of those, uh, they were, there was worshipped, and the god Sekhmet, which had a lion's head and a woman's body, uh, was worshipped, as you can see when you get to Egypt. But now what was God doing at that moment? If you would look in, in history, you'll see that from 23, 2,348 before Christ, to 1706 before Christ, of 700 years there, Egypt had close relationship with the men who knew the true and the living God. 
God sent Abraham into Egypt in Genesis 12. He went almost directly into Egypt uh, from, from Ur of the Chaldees. Before he did anything in the Holy Land, he made a trip into Egypt. God sent Jacob into Egypt. He went there and he witnessed of God's power in Genesis chapter 46. Abraham went there in Genesis chapter 12. Egypt was at that time building her pyramids. And here were men of God talking to the top man, to the pharaohs, about the living God and the true God. God sent Joseph there to be the prime minister of Egypt in order that those people might be saved, in order that they might go to heaven, in order that they might believe in the true and the living God. God was not asleep. God was loving Egypt in every empire that there ever has been. It's just like in Russia today. Russia cannot keep the word of God out of Russia. The word of God goes into Russia uh, through secret manners, uh, tourists carrying the word of God in there. Uh, the, the, the radio program's coming in and they give the word of God so slowly that the people there can write it down. And the people have the written word of God, but by listening to the, the radios that are coming out of the Orient and, and, and out of the Southern Europe in, into Russia, and the songs are saying. They sing the songs, and then they give them the words so slowly the people can write them down. And so the, you cannot keep the word of God back. And, and it was the same in this day. God was speaking to Egypt, and Egypt had rather have heathen gods in order, uh, in order not to be under the subjection of holiness that God demands people to come into. And so from 1706 before Christ to 1651 before Christ, we come to the birth of Moses. God sent Moses there. The Exodus was there, bringing the people out. And those people should never have forgotten God. When they saw the power of God to, to open up the Red Sea, to slay the people in their homes by an angel of death, they should have said, I'm going to serve that kind of God. But they rebelled against him. And God in his graciousness, and not only sent people there all the time during the kingdoms of, uh, of Israel, but God even sent Jesus there. In Matthew 2 and 13, God says, take the young child and flee into Egypt. We don't know how long they stayed there, two, three, four, five years. We don't know how long he was there, but Jesus lived in Egypt. So God had a particular love for that people. And then when the church was born, there were people from Egypt right there in Jerusalem the day the church was born. And that church called the Coptic Church in Egypt today, which is actually a restricted church and has been a greatly persecuted church in that land. God, from the time of the apostles, some of the apostles actually went and preached in Egypt so that Egypt had an opportunity to know the truth. And yet 700 years after the church was born, the Muslim faith was established in Egypt, and it has remained there from that time, and it is now the largest Arab nation on the face of the earth in, in, in numbers. And so when we see these truths, and then we can say, God, save Egypt. Now, maybe uh, the way things are moving at the present time, that, that Egypt's going to have also a mighty renewal of God. Uh, the, the, the world today is in a, in a place that's uh, uh, unsettled. And so it could be that if we pray for Egypt, God could send a mighty revival that they will love the God that saves and, and not Muhammad uh, and, 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 not, and not him as a prophet of God, uh, but to, to love the truth of God as it's inscribed in the word of God in the Bible and in the coming and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Around the world, uh, men have done very strong, very strange things. In Thailand, uh, the, the elephant is holy. And uh, in Bangkok, in the palace that I've been in many times, there's the bird woman uh, with, a, uh, with a woman's head and a bird's body and bird's feet. And in North America, the Indians and Eskimos, uh, the bear was sacred. And the, the bear was supposed to save them from the flood. In the totem bowl, I, I saw this. In, in India, uh, the cow is holy. And so from around the world, men have lowered themselves from serving the mighty and the living God uh, down to where they uh, uh, worship beasts and where they worship uh, all kinds of the lower, even snakes, uh, serpents that they worship. And the God has says, I am a holy God, worship me and him only. And I'd like to urge you at this moment that if you have been entangled with any of these eras, to come to the great truth of God, because we have the truth of God from the first man that ever lived on the face of this earth right up to this moment. And we know, we know that men had had an opportunity to know God. These people here in their hearts, they know the Ten Commandments in their spirits because God put them there. We would like for you to, to, to love God and to serve God. May I minister to you in prayer. God bless my neighbor. Help us to know uh, that God is real and that God is calling all men today to repent 
and that we are not to follow the ancient uh, diversions and the, and the ancient superstitions. We are to serve the God of now, the true God, and that God gave those people truth all along through their total history. And we thank you for such truth that set men free. Bless them, we pray, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. If you don't know the Lord, let him come into your heart right now. All you have to do is say, Lord, I'm sorry, my sin. Come into my heart. He'll do it right now. And he'll make you a new person. And I'd be glad to know about it. I have a little pamphlet, eight pages. So you've been born again. If you receive Christ as your Savior, please write me. And let me give it to you. If you enjoy these uh, programs, remember that these are all made possible through the generosity of God's people as they give to make such teaching programs possible. There are no commercials in them whatsoever. If you wish to study first, further these great truths, we have a threefold way that you can study them by videotape, audio tape, and in written form so that you can actually take them in all three at the same time. In various places, we have schools set up where, where these truths are taught. And you, you are able at that time to study the great truths of God in these areas. Avail yourself of all the truth that you can, because this is the day of knowing. This is the day of truth. And this is the day of the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. We hope that you're ready for that. You may write to me, Lester Sumrall, Post Office Box 12, South Bend, Indiana. The zip code there is 46624. We hope to hear from you soon. And if God is turning your heart toward him, communicate with us. Let us rejoice together. This is a day of rejoicing. It's very necessary for us to be close together in these days. And therefore, we do hope to hear from you by return mail. And may God wonderfully bless you. And may you find that Christ is the answer to every human need. And then you can thank God that you're not bound by the superstitions of many, many hundreds of years ago. That you have been set free by the word of God. It is God's word that sets us free. And we thank God for his word. The Lord Jesus Christ wishes to bless you today. Always remember this, that when you feed your faith, you're starving your doubts to death. Let them die.